I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Well, good morning, Victory. How are we doing? So great to have you this morning. Join us. Um, invite you to stand. And we're going to uh, go into a time of worship and praise today. If you're watching online, please sing out. It's going to be a special Sunday. We're doing an acoustic worship, so we got mandolin and some strings behind us. And so I, I hope that you can help us sing these songs. Let's point praise to our King this morning. I'm gonna sing to my heart starts changing. Oh, I'm gonna worship till I mean every word. Cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. I give. Give you my worship, cause you still deserve it. You're worthy, you're worthy. Oh, you're worthy of my song. I'll pour out your praises in blessing and breaking. You're worthy, you're worthy. Oh, you're worthy of my song. Yes, you are. King is risen, gonna preach to my soul that you've already won. And even though I can't see it, I'm gonna keep believing that every promise you made is as good as done. I give you my worship. You still deserve it. You're worthy. You're worthy. Oh, you're worthy of my soul. I pour out your praises and blessing and break it. You're worthy. You're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy of my soul. You're worthy. You're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy of my soul. panic took my breath you were worthy through every doubt that I expressed you are worthy when I don't know what comes next you are worthy I never stop singing your praise I never stop singing your praise in the blessing and the pain, you are worthy. Whether you say yes or no, wait, you are worthy. Through it all, I choose to say, you are worthy. I never stop singing your praise. I never stop singing your praise. I cry worthy when you are the 
Nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy To make you proud I'll never be more loved Than I am right now Going through a storm But I won't go down I hear your voice Carried in the rhythm of the wind To call me so clear what it's all about so stay by my side when the sun goes down don't wanna forget how i feel right now cause you are child
is our provider. He's providing. Amen. Hey, go ahead and take your seat. Again, we're, we're so blessed that you're here. Maybe you're watching online. We're so glad that you're here, that you're here to worship, that you're here to, to be in community. And uh, we're going to go into a time of communion like we do every week, but this is going to look a little bit different today. Um, we're, we're changing it up a little bit. We're going to give you some extra time where the, the worship team is going to play a song over you. And it really just goes through the, the account uh, of Jesus uh, in the garden praying all the way to the, the to the crucifixion and it really paints a picture I think of his unconditional love for us and, and in the midst of uh, our sin in the midst of our disobedience and God is he, he remains faithful and he remains reliable and so I hope this song blesses you um, the, the lights uh, will go down a little bit um, the lyrics of the song are going to be uh, up on uh, on the screen. And so if you want to sing along or if you just want to consume, uh, I hope this blesses you. I hope this moves you. And, and I hope uh, that God would receive all the glory and that he would, that we, that we, we would be grateful. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, that we'll be grateful after hearing this song and the perspective um, that it brings. Uh, let me, let me go, go ahead and pray. Uh, God, we thank you uh, that you are enough, that you are a provider and that you provided a way for us to connect back to you through your son, Jesus Christ. And so in this moment, over these next few minutes, Lord, I pray that you would receive glory, Lord, that our heart postures would please you, that our worship would please you, that it would be a reflection of how grateful that we are, that, that you would send Jesus, uh, a perfect, holy God into the, a messed up world full of messed up people that, that have sin, that have shame. And, and Father, I pray that through, the, through this song, uh, through this time, that you would receive glory and Lord, that we would take uh, another step of authenticity in our walk with you. God, we're, we're just here for but, uh, just a short time, just a vapor. And so may we realize that, may we step into being grateful. May we step into living intentionally for you. And the, the, the cross of Calvary is so profound. And we're thankful for it today. In Jesus' name, amen.
as you will Give those Roman nails Your body friend The very hands the shame The world hung up to bleed And lifted on high, crucified Him who knew no sin The Nazarene Son of man, the Lamb of God, Emmanuel, given to die. What you went through to love me, I'll never understand. What blows my mind away? me as I some baptisms and so go ahead and stay seated but let's let's celebrate these individuals Destry, I'll, I'll give it to you man Amen. we're all a little nervous how about we just all give a hand clap of praise to what god is doing here amen, amen. amen this is my friend sarah everybody say hi sarah hi. yeah that's how we break the tension in the room amen so let me ask would you believe that jesus is the christ the son of the living god Amen. So I want you to repeat after me. Let's say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Amen. Amen. Upon the, uh, your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of God's Holy Spirit. You ready? Stuff we got my friend Bart. Say hi, Bart. Hi, Bart. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all know Bart. This is Sarah's husband, and we just uh, we're just so glad. And what a beautiful moment to see a married couple do this thing together. Praise God. So, um, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I do. Amen. And so, I want you to repeat after me. Say, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Praise God. So. Praise God. 
Upon your confession of faith, you follow directions well. Upon your confession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost for the forgiveness of sins and for the free gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You ready? Ready. Let's plug your nose. We'll come, come this way a little bit. All right. I got you, I got you, I got you. Nobody saw it. Nobody saw it. If it makes you feel any better, I fell in here too, so it's okay. Amen. But when we fall, God picks us back up. Praise God. So this is my 12-year-old daughter, Selby. Everybody say hi, Selby. <laughs> Praise God. And um, so let me ask you, baby girl, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. Amen. I'm going to have you repeat after me. Say, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Praise God. Plug your nose. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry today, y'all. <laughs> upon He's the, going to. Upon, <laughs> up, upon the confession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, for the forgiveness of sins and for the free gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say hi, Ada Rose. Hi, Ada Rose. Can you guys see her? She's. <laughs> hey, Amen. So let me uh, let me ask you, Ada. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God? Yeah. Amen. Say it loudly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want you to repeat after me. Say, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Praise God. On the confession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and for the free gift of the Holy Spirit. You ready? Plug your nose. up communion we're going to continue to sing we're going to continue to pour out our praise to our great king so I invite you to stand there's a lot to be grateful for we have a God that provides we have a God that is faithful in the midst of our disobedience in the midst of our pain in the midst of whatever we got going on he's here he's with us in the valley he's with us in the mountaintops Let's sing to him Let's lift him up bless the Lord oh my soul Oh, my soul, every voice, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Yes, we do. The sun comes up. It's a new day, darling. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Yes,
like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Oh, I worship your going to take your seat. Again, thank you for being here. Um, I'm excited about this next part because uh, we are we are part of this impact. Um, we have many local partners uh, that we that we give towards, and part of our generosity is going to Clarity, which was formerly called CareNet. And is a we're we're a part of this story. We're a part of Esther's story about her daughter and, and how God is working in her life through the ministry of Clarity. So take a look and, and just know that you are a part of this impact. Hi, my name is Esther. Uh, I'm a mother of three, and I have one stepson, making four. So I, I am from Nigeria, West Africa. I came to the United yeah, States when that was 2017. I'm alone with the kids, so most of the time when I go to work, the boy they want to take care of treasure for me when I'm not there because the the daddy, the, the man I get pregnant with, he just left the house where it was nowhere to be found. So when I was at the appointment, the lady was just looking at me that she saw that I was sad. So she asked what happened. I said I don't have anything for the baby, baby stuff or anything I don't have. So she said that she could give me a couple of help. So she sent so many number to me on so many locations so i decided to just try the though i have, i called them nobody did, some didn't pick but when i called ken and they picked my call immediately and they scheduled my appointment and i was there when i was six months pregnant so it was so 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 lovely ever since then up to date everything for this baby uh car seats uh everything from ken and so they're wonderful to me and i'm great and i'm happy i'm a real parenting <laughs> program where you can earn some points while you will learning how to be a good mother by loving your kid by supporting them by knowing how they grow up and what they need how to support them how to make them a great person and how to, for you it's how to be a good mother so after you were done with all those uh, lessons you are going to earn some points and that point you bring it back to the care and that was where you're going to get whatever you need to support yourself and to support your baby i really love the lesson it touched my heart to be able to love my kids uh, enjoy them and be a supportive mother to them. And the, the most wonderful thing about them is when I don't have things that I, they don't even have, I will call them that, hello, this is sister, I didn't have baby bath. And I don't know, somebody will just say, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'll put it on Facebook, or somebody will come and bring it, and I'll call you, and they will call me. Something like that happened, they call me for baby bath. And uh, Esther, we have it now, can you come down? And I was there, and I came down like 40 minutes. To come and get the bath and they were so supportive it was just like i just feel like i'm i'm at home i don't even know it's church or something it was just so comfortable and feel at home Hoo -hoo. All, all the ladies are wonderful no even you yourself <laughs> they always support you whenever you call them oh esther especially you oh esther you're here what do you want you want to take this okay i will never that i can ask can i take this yeah yeah, yeah you can have it can i have it oh yeah, yeah you can have it so you were there all the ladies i can't even differentiate the, between them they are all wonderful they were very very supportive and so i really really thank you for what you're doing and i really appreciate it i said thank you god bless you thank you for what you do they are all wonderful people i love being with them they are number my number one family they are my supporting system so i do appreciate them a lot That's amazing, right? Oh, gosh, we love working with our local partner. That's CareNet, what they're now Clarity. And hearing from the stories of life change that happen and that come from people like Esther. We'll be hearing more of those stories and learning more about that in just a few weeks when we pick up with our Above and, above and Beyond initiative that you may be familiar with. So good morning, Victory. Welcome, whether you're joining us in person or if you're joining us online, we are so glad that you decided to come and be with us today. 
And one of the things that we love to do here is to celebrate our first time guests. I'm gonna count on you to help me welcome them as my hands are full here. So let's welcome all those first time guests today. Thank you. So if you're new, if this is your first time here, we invite you to text NEW to 317-576-2288 because we want to connect with you. We want to answer any questions that you have and provide you with information about Victory, this church that we call home. So if you're here in person, we'd invite you to, t to stop at the connection desk um, before you leave today. We have a gift for you. And if you're online, we haven't forgotten about you. Click that little button that says I'm new and we'll get you connected with somebody that can take you through those steps here at Victory. Now, if this is your church home, you've been here for two, three weeks, maybe 15 or 20 years, you know what time it is. It's time to get into that Victory app, check in and let us know how you're joining us. This is for you at home too, um, if you're joining us online. You can open up that app, click that you're joining online. This helps us to connect with you. This helps us make sure that we're doing what we need to do to connect with you and care for your family. So I'd like to take a moment now just to thank all of the game changers that are here at Victory making a difference. And what you're doing really is changing lives. If you're not a game changer yet, but you're thinking, you look around, you see the camera crew, you see the lights, you see the people on sound, the people up here, and you're wondering, how did they get involved in that? Well, it's really, really simple. So if you're looking to get plugged into our church here at Victory, stop off at the Next Steps room before you leave today. Or if you're online, again, we've got you covered. Click on the button that says, I want to be a game changer. You can also find that button in the Victory app. If you're looking through that, you're thinking about what can I do to help, click on the button in the Victory app that says, I'd like to be a game changer. There's a spot for you here. There really is. Now, while you're in that Victory app, it's a good one. We've set up a top three system so that you can see the most pertinent top three things that are coming up soon. So click on that, stay informed, stay involved. It's a really nice setup. Everything that you guys see here is all a, uh, it's all part of the sacrifice that somebody has made here for Victory to do God's work. And so it's our combined generosity at work that's fueling the mission and the vision of our church and what God is doing here. So if you have given anything in the past, whether it's your time, your talent, or your treasure, thank you. Really, it makes a difference. And if you haven't yet, but you're looking forward to give in some way, I've got a few ideas for you. So as you walk into the auditorium, as you go up to the stairs, we do have giving boxes where you can drop off your gift or you can give online at victorycc.life slash give or through the Victory app. And there's also the way you can mail in your check to the address that you see on your screen. Your generosity truly is changing lives forever. So thank you. Now, David is gonna come out in just a few moments and he's gonna be bringing us week four of Jesus Changes Everything for Everyone. And first I'd like to pray before he comes out. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity to gather together to worship you around the world. We thank you for all that you have done to bless our lives. We ask you to take the gifts that we present for you today, and we ask that you use those gifts to expand your kingdom. And as David comes out today, bless him and allow us to hear your word, allow us to change our hearts, and also build that kingdom of heaven here on earth. We ask this through all things, as we ask all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus, the name that changes everything. Look around. The people you see here, they've been changed and are still being changed in the name of Jesus. Now, look at yourself. When it comes to your connection with God, what would you change? When you look at your life, what needs to change? Do you believe that Jesus can change that for you? Scripture shows that Jesus changed people regardless of their gender, their race, or their religious background, regardless of their struggle, their baggage, or even their questions. When we look at the interactions Jesus had with others, we can have confidence that we can experience true transformation too because Jesus changes everything for everyone. What if that could be true for you 
today. I want to begin today's message with a proverb, all right? Whether you've been in church just for a little bit of time or you've been in church for a long, long time, I think you'll be familiar with this proverb. You might even know the author. Here's the proverb. Nothing good happens after midnight. Who said that? Well, your mom said it. Your mom or your grandma or somebody's mom, you've heard this. Nothing good happens after midnight. And it's true. Think about the memories that you have that are after midnight. How many of them are really wholesome? How many of your after midnight memories are really God honoring things? Uh, as a kid, it usually meant for me, we were up to no good. Sneaking out, creating some kind of tomfoolery there. And what's funny is when you really think about all your memories that happen after midnight, so many of them are when you're young. Because let's be honest, we reach an age, a time where we just don't see midnight too much anymore. You know, I start yawning at 8 p.m. these days. How often do I really see midnight? Not often. I was saying this to a buddy of mine, though, in his 40s. He's like, I disagree, man. I, I see midnight all the time. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, that's my first potty break, usually, <laughs> is midnight. Uh, why do we say nothing good happens after midnight? Well, because people do things in the dark that they wouldn't normally do in the light. Uh, we do these things, things that we would never dream about doing, if people could see in the cover of night, we'll do it. I mean, who in their right mind would TP a house in the daylight? You've never seen anybody play ding dong ditch at 4 p.m. I mean, who would eat at Waffle House if the sun is still up? These are just things that we don't often do. We do things at night for several reasons, because they're sinful, because we don't want people to judge us, because we're ashamed of what it is that we're doing. I want to tell you about something I did at 2 a.m. when I was 24 years old. Am I really going to do this? I don't... Okay, I'll just go with it. I was living in Cincinnati. Uh, Amanda and I were married for only a year, no kids yet. At 2 a.m. while my innocent wife was sleeping, I slipped out of bed. I looked back at her and thought, man, she deserves better than this. Um, I grabbed the keys to my car, and I start driving at, at 2 a.m. Um, there's nobody on the road, so I'm just lost in my thoughts about this terrible decision I was about to make. I arrive at my destination. Target. Target. Uh, and you're like, wait, Target, that's not open at 2 a.m. Why are you going there? Well, I know I got there five hours before it opened because I wanted to buy one of these. This is, a, this is a PlayStation 4, a video game console that came out nine years ago. And if you know me, you're like, David, you play video games? I really don't. I don't. I, I mean, ask my wife. I, I really don't. But at the time, 2013, I thought, hey, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll play this. Uh, and I maybe did a little bit, but it didn't get a lot of use. We moved to Indiana five years ago, and it still has Ohio dust on it in my house right now. It's just not played. But a buddy of mine was into him, and he was actually my small group leader. So I thought, yeah, I'll go for this adventure. Um, I didn't have the same hobbies then as I do now. I had a little bit more income. I wouldn't make any money, just didn't have any kids. You know how that goes. And I never waited in line overnight for anything. And I got to tell you, I'm probably never going to do that again. Um, and why? Well, because of that proverb, nothing good happens after midnight, said your mama. This was mid-November. When I got there, it was 2.15 in the morning. There were already a couple guys in line. I could see other cars pulling up. I thought for a second, man, I'll just sit here in my warm Honda Accord and just wait a while. But then I didn't know how many of these consoles did Target get. I wasn't sure. So I bundled up and I went and stood in line. And I did not want to be seen. I was embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed telling you this story right now. I was embarrassed then. Um, so I bundled up to where really just kind of my eyes could be visible. And I just stood in line silent for five hours. The people watching and the conversations I overheard they just confirm this proverb, nothing good happens after midnight. I believe that Target is a family-friendly business during business hours. But if you're in line at three in the morning in November with a bunch of gamers, things change a little bit. <laughs> nothing good happens after midnight. So I'm standing there like a dummy and it's at night. If it would have been like a 6 p.m. release, no way I'm showing up. I don't want anybody to see me. I don't want anybody to know that I'm doing this. 
And now today, so many years later, I'm left with the most expensive, dusty paperweight you could possibly find in my basement. It was a great decision. We're in week four of our series, Jesus Changes Everything for Everyone. And I want to tell you a story about another man who left his home in the middle of the night to do something that he didn't want anybody else to see. So if you got your Bible, we're in the Gospel of John today. We'll specifically be starting in chapter 3. Here's what John says. He says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. He said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with them. So we have a man here named Nicodemus, and John says Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And not only that, he was an elite Pharisee. He was in the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. Now, if you've been in church before, I know for me, when somebody says Pharisee, the alarm starts to go off and I think it's bad, bad context. But here's what you need to know is that Pharisees were actually the good guys in the ancient Near East. They were seen in the Jewish circles as the leaders. They were admired by so many people, respected by people. They had this visible honorable faith in God. Uh, they, they were law followers. They studied the Torah. Um, the Pharisees were religious leaders and people revered them for it. Now it says Nicodemus was not only a Pharisee, but he was a member of the Sanhedrin. There was about 6,000 total Pharisees back then. There were even less. There were 70-ish total members of the Sanhedrin. So this Nicodemus that we're talking about He's elite of the elite. He is uh, basically on the Jewish Senate there. And what was the biggest thorn in the side of the Sanhedrin at this time? I mean, no doubt it was this rogue Jewish carpenter from Galilee who's creating all this chaos in the land. So Nicodemus, he visited Jesus in the darkness of night. Why? Jesus had a public ministry. Nicodemus is, is kind of in the upper crust of Jewish elite leaders. And why couldn't he just go find him during the day? He could have arranged a meeting, don't you think, with Jesus? But no, he went at night. Well, because he didn't want anybody to see him with Jesus. He wanted this to be a secret. He didn't want anybody to question what he was doing. Nevertheless, Nicodemus did visit Jesus because he felt like, I got to talk to this guy. I have to. And he said, he'd already concluded that Jesus was a teacher from God. Remember to this point, what had Jesus done? Well, he'd already taken this nasty hand wash and water. He turned it into choice wine. It said in John's gospel, Jesus had been doing all kinds of signs among the people. Nicodemus knew it and he had to figure out what was going on. So Jesus replied to Nicodemus. Here's what he said. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Nicodemus didn't even ask a question yet. Jesus just comes out with this. It feels a little aggressive, a little dramatic, but you got to remember who made the first bold move. It was Nicodemus. He's showing up there at night. It's late. Jesus cuts right to the chase. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And think about how piercing, how jolting this must have been for Nicodemus. Up to this point, what had he done? He just earned everything that he had as a Pharisee. He had worked his way to the top. He had a PhD in Judaism. He had gone to all the right ceremonies, studied under all the right people. His whole life to this point is based on working and earning and working and earning. And here, Nicodemus basically compliments Jesus. He comes in with this humble and kind posture to Jesus, and his pockets are full of this religious currency that he'd been earning, Nicodemus. And he basically just lays it on the table to Jesus. And Jesus says what? He's like, that's not, your money's not good here. You can't earn your way into the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. And Jesus is saying, look, all that studying, all that working, all that achieving, it's good, it's fine, but it's not going to get you where you need to be. Isaiah 64 says, our righteousness is filthy rags compared to God's holiness. It's not going to get us very far. And Jesus offers something very different, totally different. This is the first point. Jesus, uh, whereas religion demands that we achieve, well, Jesus invites us to receive. Religion, what's it do? It just demands that we achieve and earn and work. Jesus, on the other hand, he invites us to receive. Every religion, without exception, that ever had any traction, it demands something of its followers. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of them, all of them require something of the follower in order to be righteous, in order to achieve enlightenment or whatever the end thing is, salvation. Jesus, in the way that he always does, though, he topples this flawed thinking and he 
declares that salvation is attainable. It is, but not by anything you can do. Not by anything that you can do, but by what I have already done. We merely need to receive his grace. Whereas religion demands that we achieve, well, Jesus invites us to receive. I grew up in a church. It wasn't like this church. Uh, And before I talk more about my experience, let me just say this. It's just my experience. That's all it is. It's not a wholesale assessment of any one person or any denomination. Because the truth is God used a pile of different people to build my faith. Spiritual giants from all different bends. Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist, open theist, premillennialist, all kinds of different people. And I might not agree with a lot of the stuff that they believe or the peripheral features of their faith. But we have very important things in common. And I love to focus on the things that we have in common because their faith impacted me regardless of the differences. And let me say this too. It doesn't matter what your background is. You here today or you watching online, doesn't matter what church you used to go to. You're welcome here at Victory. You are. And I encourage you, the more people you talk to around here, the more you will discover that we just, we all have varied backgrounds. Here at Victory, we might not subscribe to what your last church believed or taught. It might be different here, but I can promise you that we are pursuing biblical truth here and that we are running after Jesus and that you're welcome here. So, but anyway, I grew up in a church that felt very works oriented. I've heard a lot of you feel the same about your church upbringing. The official doctrine didn't claim to be that way, but I felt like as a child and I internalized Hey, you got to be good. You got to do this. You got to do that in order to earn your way into heaven. Confess your sins, say these prayers, do these deeds, take communion, all these things. They're good, but I internalized it like they were necessary, like the work hadn't been done and you need to do this in order to earn your way. And as a result, I didn't have any real faith in high school or in starting into college. There was nothing really there. It was all built on sand. The foundation was super weak. And so the easy thing for me to do growing up was just to abandon it. There's not a lot there anyway. And I did. That's what I chose to do. And I got to tell you, it brought me a whole lot of pain in my life. Religion demanded that I achieve, but Jesus, he just invites us to receive. Religion calls us uh, to live for the blessing. Jesus calls us to live from the blessing. Religion says, pray. It says, serve, sacrifice, do good, witness for the blessing. Jesus says, no, no, you're already blessed. You are already blessed. Now go pray and serve and sacrifice and give and do good and witness from that place of blessing. Huge difference. And when I finally had ears to hear that, when the truth finally got a hold of me, uh, I accepted Christ. I was, I was baptized. And you know what? All those things that I felt like I had to do as a kid, all those things, I suddenly started to do them slowly, but I started to do them. And it wasn't out of obligation. It wasn't out of guilt this time. It was a response of gratitude. It was out of love. I had a desire to start doing these things, not because of anything I did, but because of a gift that I could just receive. So Jesus answers the question Nicodemus didn't even ask, but with a perfect response Nicodemus needed to hear, he says, hey, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And Nicodemus responds. What does he say when Jesus says that? Well, he says, hey, how can somebody be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. And I don't think Nicodemus is genuinely positing this question. I think what he's doing is saying, okay, you're saying you got to be born again, Jesus. I know what that doesn't mean. Now tell me what it actually does mean. Okay. And then Jesus answers and he says, Nicodemus, very truly, I'll tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, Jesus says, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. There's a lot going on here. Two big things that you really got to see. Number one is simply being a descendant of Abraham. It's not grounds for admission in the kingdom of God. Okay. To this point, many of the Jews felt just because of who they were, that they were entitled to this just because of the origin of, of their flesh. And as you know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, but that's not going to do it. It's flesh that gives birth to the flesh. Spirit, something totally different, giving birth to the spirit. Believing in your heart, being baptized in water, receiving the Holy Spirit, 
Jesus is ushering in a new way. He's doing something altogether different, altogether unique. And who your daddy is or your physical lineage, it doesn't get you there. It's not enough for access to the kingdom of God. And what's really cool here is that in the Greek text, in verse 7, you actually see a switch. Uh, John switches from the singular to the plural. He says, hey, um, Jesus says, you, Nicodemus, you leader of the Jews, uh, you should not be surprised. Uh, and then he switches to the plural form of you. And in Indiana, they don't have a word for this, but don't worry, my people figured it out. He says, y'all must be born again, y'all. The collective you, he switches because it's more of a collective thing here. He's, he's talking to all of the Jews here. The, big, the second big thing you got to see here is Jesus starts to illustrate the mystery of the Spirit. The wind blows where it pleases. What, what does he mean? Well, you, you know it's here. You can hear it. Uh, some of you were on fall break recently and, you, and you, you heard the waves as they crashed into the shore. And then you come back home and the rust-colored leaves, you hear them as they sort of blow through the yard. Do you see the air, the wind? No, you don't, but you see the effects. It's undeniable that you can, you can see and hear the wind, or you can hear the wind even though you can't see it. It reminds me of uh, two weeks ago, I was up at Victory in the City, got to preach there. And I shared this story with them. I want to share it with you. A while back, I was talking to a buddy of mine, a college buddy, who's not a believer, doesn't believe in God. And he said, really, I only believe in stuff I can see. If I could see God, if he could just come here and I, I would just know because I would see him and then I would believe. And I said, is that right? He said, yeah. I was like, do you have a computer? I said, yeah, of course. Why? I said, well, do you have Wi-Fi? He's like, yeah. Well, you believe in that? He said, okay, okay. I said, what about the wind? You know, just like John talks about here in the gospel. What about things like love? You believe in love? What about mercy and justice? Have you ever seen those things? What about hot and cold? You ever seen that? Uh, what about all these other things, energy, momentum, the list goes on and on, things that you've never once laid your eyes on, but you surely believe in them. So to the people who say, hey, if I could only see, if I could just see with my eyes and I would believe, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. If your heart is hardened toward the God of the Bible, if you don't have ears to hear, there's not any amount of evidence that will change your mind and break through because it's all around you right now. You got to really try to ignore it to not see it. Think about it. Tons of people saw Jesus heal and bring Lazarus back from the dead. And this guy was not asleep. He was dead, dead. I mean, they described the scene as they could smell it. He had already, they'd already had the funeral. Jesus shows up way late. He brings him back to life. Tons of eyewitnesses were there, and still some of them didn't believe. They, they tried to stop Jesus at the time with some of their responses. So what I'm saying is, if you just think seeing is believing, it can't be right. If your heart is hardened toward the possibility of God, it won't matter what God does. Uh, you've you've got to be open to it. And Nicodemus says, after Jesus explains all this stuff, he says, well, how can this be? And Jesus says, well, hey, Nicodemus, you're Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak about heavenly things? If my last little anecdote sounded like an affront against unbelievers or if it sounded a little harsh toward skeptics, atheists, let me quickly say this. That's not my heart at all. Jesus was never like that. That's not how Jesus rolled. He was way more stern with the believers than he was with any unbeliever, always. Jesus was always demanding more from the people of faith rather than the skeptic. And for good reason, because we Christians, we Jesus followers all the time, we have every reason to believe that God can do anything in and around us. We've seen it so many times. And yet I know, and maybe you've felt this way too, I've asked God for something before in prayer and then in the back of my mind thought, nah, it's not, he's not gonna do that. It's not actually gonna happen. So my question is, why do we limit God to the bounds of our understanding? I'm asking this to myself. Why do I limit God to the bounds of my own understanding? Somehow our minds work like this sometimes. If it doesn't make sense to me, then it won't be possible with God. You see how ridiculous that is? We project our own little tiny self-centered perspective on the person we attribute to the creation of the universe. It doesn't make any sense uh, that if, if, if the God you serve was limited to only act in the ways that you could dream up, 
If God could only act in just the way that you have it thought out at just the right time, do you see how silly that is? Your God is too small. Why do we limit God to the bounds of our own understanding? How many, how many so-called impossible things has he done in your life? I surely can't be the only one. Why do we limit God to just the things that we can understand? And that's what Jesus is accusing of the Pharisees right here. That's what he's saying to them. And then Jesus continues. He says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, what's going on there? We'll talk about that in a second. So the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. This, the snake thing is actually a reference to Numbers chapter 21. Moses and the Israelites, they're traveling through the desert and the people are, they're hungry, they're tired, uh, they're thirsty, everything's going wrong and they start speaking against God. When a bunch of venomous snakes come into their camp, start biting people, people are dying. Moses calls out to God. God says, okay, um, make a bronze snake, put it on a pole, have the people look at the snake and then they will be healed. They will not die. And that's what happens. Moses does that. And at the time, they didn't really know what it meant. It had, it had nothing to do with the snake. It had everything to do with them trusting in God. But what's cool to see from our vantage point is this was a massive foreshadowing. Just as the Israelites uh, were saved by looking upon this snake on a pole, later we are saved by looking upon Christ lifted up on a cross there was nothing they could do in their distress but fix their eyes on this image that God ordained. And likewise, in our state of devastation, when we're looking upon death, there's nothing that we can do except look upon this God-ordained image of Christ on the cross. That's the only way that we are saved. And right here in the story of Nicodemus is probably the most famous verse in the, yeah, it's definitely the most famous verse in the entire Bible. It's on in and out cups. It's on Forever 21 bags. You saw it on Tim Tebow's Eye Black. You know this, John 3, 16. It says, right here in Nicodemus' story, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then for good measure, the next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus says to Nicodemus very directly, hey, whoever believes will have eternal life. And then John further explains it in what's the golden verse that, you know, John three sixteen. And we're not sure if Nicodemus responded right away. Did he accept the good news right there? Was it a slow burn? Not really sure. But Nicodemus, remember this great Pharisee, this great member of the Sanhedrin, he pops up two more times in John's gospel. And it really profound what happens here. By John chapter seven, we're skipping ahead a little bit. The popularity of Jesus has just exploded. I mean, tremendously. And now the Sanhedrin, they're feeling threatened. We have got to deal with this guy. We have got to draw up some charges against him. We got to get rid of this false teacher, they thought. So they got these 70 or so powerful men in there. And all of a sudden, Nicodemus is in this contentious moment. Will he speak up? Will he say anything when they're talking about what they're going to do to Jesus? Will Nicodemus do anything? And imagine this scene. He's sitting there, all these important men there. He's sitting there, just one of about 70, heart pounding. He's sweating. His mind's racing. What am I going to do here? Am I really going to stick up for this most wanted man in the town? Am I going to do this? And here's where it records in John. Two verses. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? He's saying, hey, doesn't Jesus deserve a trial maybe? And here they, they jump right back and they bite right back at him and they insult him and they attack his pride. They say, hey, are you from Galilee too, Nicodemus? Are you from this little podunk town? Why are you sticking up for this guy? So again, that, that's the first way Nicodemus comes back. But then we read about Nicodemus one more time. And this comes much later in John's gospel. This is all the way to chapter 19. We're fast forwarding. Jesus has just died on the cross. Okay, now we're entering this scene and let's see who appears again. Later, Joseph of Arimathea, he asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, Joseph came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus the man who earlier has visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. 
At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, here it is again, Joseph and Nicodemus laid Jesus there. That's the same man who met with Jesus in secret in the dark of night. What we see now is he's not keeping it a secret anymore. He brings this expensive, extravagant perfumes to anoint the body with. Myrrh was actually often used as a consecrating gift for high priests and for kings. Nicodemus' life collided with Jesus here, and he just could not stay the same. Christian tradition asserts that Nicodemus became a martyr for his faith in that first century. I want to share with you this. Pride says, I've got this. That's really what pride is. I got this. Surrender, though, is different. It says, God's got me. Pride, I got this. It's on me. I'm in control. Surrender, no, I don't. God's got me. The Pharisees, they were well, well respected, but man, they were prideful. Pride was their downfall. And pride was what Nicodemus was all about for most of his life. He was proud of his religion, of his accomplishments, all that it afforded him. He'd done so much. He'd done really well, and he was proud. And to protect his pride, he came to Jesus at night when nobody could see it. But it's hard to encounter Jesus and stay the same. (laughs) So whether it was right away or a slow maturation, Nicodemus eventually dumped his pride. First at the Sanhedrin meeting, right, when he stuck up for Jesus and said, hey, doesn't he at least deserve a trial? And then later, the man that he once opposed as a Pharisee, that he later came and called teacher at night, that he eventually ascribed as his own high priest and king, later Nicodemus showed up again. See, pride says, I got this. But surrender says, no, I don't. God does. God's got me. And I said, for my unbelief, most of my life was, was due to this works focus that the church that I grew up in had. That's part of it. I would say maybe even a bigger part, though, was just my own pride. My life was fine. It was, it was good. I was excelling personally. I had people's respect. I didn't want to depend on anybody. I didn't feel like I needed anybody until I did. Um, see, I was battling the depression and, and anxiety in freshman and sophomore year of college as an 18, 19 year old. And to, at levels, it'd be hard for me to understand. I don't mean that, oh, I had a little season of sadness and I was biting my nails nervously. I mean, I was severely depressed. Um, the, I remember as 18, 19 year old, the doctor looking at me and my mother standing next to me and saying, yeah, you have severe depression and anxiety. I couldn't leave my room for periods of a time. I lost a bunch of weight. I was sort of wasting away. People around me could tell. On the outside, you'd be like, what's wrong? Your life looks good, but I couldn't describe it. My closest friends and my family knew this about me. Well, at the same time, God was using this guy on campus in college to reach me. I was totally broken and lost. I was a skeleton walking around. And I ran into this dude on campus a bunch. He always remembered my name. He remembered my major. He remembered my classes. He remembered my friends' names. He would always talk to me, and he annoyed me. I did not want to talk to this guy at all. I just wanted him to leave me alone. But finally, one day, I confronted him. I said, dude, what's your deal? (laughs) What do you want from me? And he invited me to this campus church service. And I wish that it would have happened at night, because I would have loved for nobody to know that I went. I wanted it to be secret. I think I lied to my roommates about where I was going. I didn't want anybody to know. So I showed up kind of right on time or a little late. I sat in the back in this building on campus and I heard the gospel for maybe the 500th time in my life, but really the first time in my life. And it wrecked me. And now I know why. Because I had no pride left. I had nothing left. I was barely there. My own pride was preventing me from ever really considering that God was real and that I needed him. So I believe that God turned me to my own devices. He said, okay, I'll let you captain this ship. And I took it right down into the pit that I was digging myself. And it's only at that point where I could realize I don't got this. And it was in that state, uh, void of all my pride, that I could fully surrender and say, God, I need you. I need you. I I need you to pick me up and restore me. And God did that very day. And he has every day since then, he's been doing it in me. I told my wife I was going to share an embarrassing story about me today. So you heard it here. And it, it's not about my struggle. It was the one about the, the video game console. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the one I'm embarrassed about. Um, no, but seriously, I'm not the slightest bit embarrassed or ashamed of my story because it really is not my story. It's God's. 
That was the only way. It had to happen like that for me, for me, for God to be able to reach me. And I don't ever, maybe might not ever know, but I believe somebody in here hears it and it resonates and it might help. So I'll continue to tell it. Um, Remember our proverb that we started with, nothing good happens after midnight. Nothing good. Your mama said that, but it's not in the Bible. Sometimes good things do happen after midnight. It's not always true. Nicodemus went to Jesus after midnight. And while some might scoff and ridicule and say, ah, look what he was doing, that he had no courage. That's not what Jesus did. He did the opposite. He never looked down on Nicodemus. He never, he never scoffed at him or ridiculed him for that. And I love this quote from Paul Butler talking about that. He says, he who came to seek and save the lost, he never smothered the faintest spark of belief, but ever strove to fan it into a burning fire of faith and devotion. The faintest spark. If you have the faintest spark of belief sitting here today or watching online, if that's you, if you're mostly like, I don't believe this stuff, but there's a tiny bit of you that says maybe Jesus is who he says he is. If that's you, what I'm telling you to do is you got to go to him. Even if it's at night, even if you don't want anybody to know, you got to give him a real honest chance this time to show you. Don't for one second be ashamed or deterred by your tiny little faint spark of faith or disbelief, you have to allow God a chance to fan that into a a, a big fire. We're in week four of this series. We've been using the same challenges to end, and I'm going to wrap up in the same way, okay? Same challenges. This is how strong we believe in this. Challenge number one for you is, would you pray and ask Jesus to show up in your life this week? Do this, pray and ask Jesus to show up. And for those who do follow Jesus, hey, maybe it's time to start following him in the daytime. Maybe it's time to take that next step or to share your story or do something in the light. And hey, that's actually challenge number two. Share your story, share what Jesus has changed for you. Do you need something extravagant, elaborate, something dramatic? No, not at all. It doesn't have to be some crazy visible change. You're not gonna be judged, but you will probably help somebody if you hear it. It's not even your story to keep. It's God. So you, please, I'm encouraging you to tell it. Victorycc.life slash resources. You can do that. And the third one, challenge number three, is ask yourself, if nothing has changed, why not? If nothing has changed, why not? It's insanity to think that, that things should be different if you're not doing anything different, if your posture is not any different. It's not about achieving. It's about receiving. Remember, religion is achieving. Jesus is inviting us to receive. It's not about being good enough. It's the realization and the surrender to say, I am not good enough. It's not about helping ourselves. It's about saying, God, I can't do this without you. We can't do this on our own. If nothing has changed, why not? Why not? Run toward Jesus like you haven't done it yet. Even if it's past midnight, even if you have this tiny little little spark of faith. Just watch what he'll do with it. Give him a chance to do something great with it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the baptisms that we had this morning, God, for the lives made new in you. I thank you, God, that we don't have to earn anything, that we can't earn anything. It's not even possible. God, I thank you for the work that you've already done, what you call us into, that you've invited us to. I pray that everyone in here, whether they've got the faintest little spark or they've been growing their faith, that we just take a next step, that we pursue you. Maybe it's at night, slowly at first, when no one else can see God, but that we eventually have a faith that burns bright even in the daytime. I thank you for the way you love us, God, even when we're unlovable, the way you pursue us relentlessly. God, help us to pursue other people in your name in that same way. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we say this all the time. We believe everybody has a next step. We'd love to talk to you in the Next Steps room. If you want prayer, if you want to have a conversation about this series or anything, share your story. It's it's, it's time to do it. We'd love for you to. Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. Have a great week.